This meeting is being recorded. Hi, my name's Maya Rose Craig and I'm a 19 year old environmental and race activist who lives near Bristol and I started my organisation, my charity Black to Nature about six years ago when I was 13. And I've growing up, I always had a really strong relationship with birds, nature, the outdoors. I loved going outside. And I think I really grew to appreciate the positive impact that engaging with nature can have on your mental and physical health. But at the same time, I was, apart from my mum and my sister, pretty much the only person I ever saw who wasn't white. Um, I'm half Bangladeshi out in the countryside. Um, and very quickly I grew to understand um, that there were some major systemic issues going on in the background. Um, I also do lots of other campaigning, environmental campaigning to do with um, an anti-climate change obviously, plastic pollution, deforestation, um, destructive farming practices and global climate justice which is all about promoting pe the voices of people in the global south who are experiencing the effects of things like climate change right now. Um, and the team that we have for Black to Nature is um, brilliant. We have Helena who's chair, she's a retired solicitor. Chris who's in charge of finance, he's a retired program manager who ran multi-million pound projects. Um, Alex, who's a business consultant, Jackie and Sonia, who are both lawyers, um, Aisha, who's amazing, she organises and run camps and she's been doing that with us since the very start, um, six years ago, and Manira and Lily, who have 30 years of expertise and experience in race, diversity and visual minority ethnic BME communities, as well as we also have 50 volunteers with expertise in nature and or VME communities. We've been working in partnership with the RSPB and organising camps together, as well as with the community farm. And in terms of why I started Black to Nature, there were loads of different reasons for that. Like I mentioned before, um, you know, I think it's just so, so important for our mental and physical well-being. Um, I also, I suppose, growing up was very aware specifically of mental illness within um, ethnic minority communities within the UK. Um, I've heard that up to 60% of people sectioned in the UK are minority ethnic, despite them making up about, I think, 12% of the population. Um, and obviously that has so many knock-on effects within the community, um, including poverty, including education, um, including, like I said, well-being in other areas. And I felt that something really effective, which we have been doing this whole time, would just be to take kids somewhere new, um, I suppose, to show them how going outdoors, going into nature can help and just try and give them the tools to manage their own mental well-being. Um, which has been incredibly effective. For a lot of them, it's also the first time that they've been able to leave the area that they grew up in, definitely the first time that they've gone anywhere without their parents. Um, and a lot of the kids that we spend a lot of time talking to um, think a lot about their goals in life and their education and where they're actually headed. Um, and I suppose they're, they often talk about how their horizons have been broadened just by having more opportunities to go somewhere new. Um, in I went to a relatively um, privileged secondary school for the most part, but there are also large groups of people, about 20%, who came from a very deprived area in South Bristol, even though it's a very wealthy city. Um, and despite that, 28% uh, of the kids in Bristol are you know, receiving free school meals, and again, I felt like there were so many behind the scenes systemic issues and I just wanted to be able to do something and to contribute. And I think Black to Nature has definitely done that. Or oh, that's the impression that I've gotten by speaking to, you know, some of the hundreds of kids that we work with over the past few years. So I personally care about so many different social issues. Um, and I've always wanted to do everything I can to stop inequality and being hyper aware, especially because I've been very lucky and have been able to travel 
about um you know how inequality creates inequality and pockets of poverty um and how by even giving a kid the slightest foot up can make masses of difference um i started a blog called bird girl when i was 12 years old um and i very quickly used that as a platform to i suppose promote diversity within environmental areas within the nature sector um, and I remember when I started, a lot of people were talking about how there are just certain groups of people, aka non-white people, um, who just weren't capable of going out into nature, enjoying being in nature, engaging with nature, um, and that it wasn't worth the effort. They weren't worth the effort, of, despite how important it is for us. Um, there are lots of people these days talking about how nature should be a human right. There are lots of people highlighting the fact that obviously the NHS is doing things like green prescribing these days. Um, and obviously that very first camp that we did completely proved them wrong. And so many of the kids that we work with just talk about how they never would have thought that they'd enjoy it, but it's just been a completely life-changing experience for them. Um, on a more personal level, I have been campaigning about so many global issues over the years. The very first thing I ever campaigned about was when there was an oil spill in the Shundabons, this amazing mangrove forest in Bangladesh. Um, and this oil spill happened in 2014 and just no one in the Western media was talking about it. No one seemed to care, even though it was one of the last places um, that many, many species were living, including things like the Bengal tiger. Um, so I ended up sort of taking it upon myself and I ended up raising about $35,000 um, to help with the oil spill because again, just no one was talking about it. And it helped me realize just how big a difference children can make as well. And I, on the other side of things, totally, totally believe that by empowering the kids that we work with, reminding them that they can achieve things, they can make a difference. I also think again, um, we're helping to create this mindset where they understand that their opinions do matter and their goals matter and where they want to go in life matters, as well as, um, you know, encouraging people to join the environmental movement, the climate change movement, which is so, so urgent at the moment. This meeting is being recorded. So um, in terms of the work that we're doing, I'd say the Black to Nature's work, uh, my work, I suppose, has four different parts. Um, the first one is running the nature camps, running the events for VME children, teenagers and families. Um, one of the things that we always, always do is make sure that our volunteers that are actually working with people are always VME, that these sessions are always VME led, so that we're always working to inspire, motivate, empower all of the young people that we're working with. And so that sometimes for the first time, they can see examples of people from their community going out and again, seizing what they want and achieving their goals. Um, we get them engaged with nature, connected to environmental issues, talking quite often for the first time about topical issues. Um, but also we spend quite a lot of time talking to them one-on-one -on -one about their personal experiences, things like racism in school and how to tackle it, um, you know, manage their anger and frustration at extremely unfair treatment, um, and also talking about their careers and what they're planning on doing in the future. I want to tackle extreme poverty in the UK by just tackling inequality head on and empowering young ethnic minority young people to just believe in themselves. Um, one of my favourite examples was a couple of Sudanese boys, some brothers who attended a camp in 2019 um, and they were talking vaguely about wanting to be a lawyer but both boys were extremely angry because they went to an incredibly middle-class white school and were being excluded, experiencing lots of racism, were being pushed into um, A-levels that wouldn't facilitate what they wanted to do because they weren't deemed as being clever, lots of things like that. And we spent a lot of time talking to them and empowering them. Um, and they got in contact recently and told us that they were going away to university to study law, that they decided to push through and study that because of those conversations that they'd had with us. 
I think that reducing the attainment gap in the UK is essential um, to tackling issues like poverty. Um, and I think personally, again, I'm hyper aware of that just because I have a, a lot of Bangladeshi family and I'm very connected to Bangladeshi community, um, which is, I think, right at the bottom of the ladder in terms of attainment at the moment. And that's something I'm absolutely working to change. Um, we take children from all backgrounds on the camps um, and we have, especially with the primary school camps, um, actually encourage white middle class children from the countryside, from the local very rural, very white villages um, to come on these camps and to mix with children of other backgrounds and to really encourage community cohesion and reduce, hopefully by doing that, reduce racism. Um, when the kids haven't realised that we're there, we've heard so many amazing conversations, just learning and exploring different cultures. Um, you know, children just very, very innocently asking why girls are wearing hijab and things like that and discovering, um, I suppose, that there are different beliefs, different religions, again, different cultures out there. And I think that's so, so important. We also do conferences. So we've run four sorry, three, three conferences tackling conservation and pushing for the environmental sector to become ethnically diverse as it is currently the second worst in the UK with only 0 0.6 of it being eth ethnic minority. We also do lots and lots of training behind the scenes with various organisations, giving lots of talks, speaking on lots of pan panels, doing workshops, um, just really, again, pushing for diversity within organisations because there is a lot of privilege and a lot of systemic racism behind the scenes. There's these whole systems of um, needing to do volunteering for several years and things like that to get into the sector. And we're really, again, pushing for that to change because it means that if you're not coming from a privileged background, you'll hopefully be able to go into the environmental or the nature sector. Um, I'm also an environmental activist who's really heavily campaigning for the impact of climate change to be fair around the globe, um, which is a global climate justice. We in the global north have created the issues of climate breakdown, but it's those in the global south who are experiencing that and suffering because of that right now. Um, I personally have family that lives in the village in Bangladesh um, who are who have really been struggling dealing with things like unseasonal flooding sweeping across uh, away the crops for this year and the year after um, and leaving them without food. Um, and so I think genuinely one of the main ways if you're looking at this intersectionally to help deal with extreme poverty around the world, um, especially in countries in the global south, um, a lot of that comes back to climate change. And once you r remove that issue, um, a lot of countries are able to develop and a lot of people are able to move on with their lives in a way that they're not able to at the moment. Um, we obviously are dealing with a lot of climate change refugees at the moment in Dhaka, the capital city of Bangladesh. There are about four million um, and the number is rising weekly. So I absolutely think that climate change is at the root of a lot of global poverty at the moment. This meeting is being recorded. One of the things that I've really prided myself on in terms of my work um, with Black to Nature and my work all around race and diversity is that it has been um, extremely disruptive. I know that when I started my campaigning about six years ago, um, there was real anger that I even wanted to have these conversations. I was working, I was trying to work um, in, a, in an extremely white liberal space. And for a lot of people, it was extremely, extremely uncomfortable um, to suspect in any shape or form that there might be systemic racism going on in the background because it was seen as a very liberal space. Um, and people didn't want to think that the organizations they might be working for, working with, um, might be racist. Um, so it was in, um, in very, um, I suppose, unwilling to have those conversations at the start. And I really had to push for that 
um, had to do a lot of very explicit open campaigning on social media, really calling out various organizations and forcing them to listen, forcing them to have those conversations and to change. Um, because a lot of it was just totally unwilling at the start. Um, I would work my way up as high as possible within various organizations and demand change um, with quite often the CEOs, um, which was very effective um, and various other things. And I think it was very difficult at the time, um, but that has again worked really well. And now there is an entire sector, which even though it's decades behind most, is at least really wanting that change. Um, but of course, I'm going to continue to be disruptive. And another way that I do that has in the last few years has been after educating myself about um, the really difficult relationship between indigenous people and global conservation has been to, cam to campaign for indigenous people's rights around the world. I'm an ambassador for the organization Survival International. Um, and something that was relatively, I suppose, pushed down or wasn't really, most people didn't really know about has been something that I've been spreading as much as possible um, and has been linked to some very, very large organisations like WWF, which again, people really don't want to hear, but I think these conversations are so important. Um, for example, there was a huge amount of evidence that WWF trained and paid guards had raped, tortured and murdered um, various indigenous people in the Congo. Um, and I hadn't seen, well, I still really haven't seen anyone else talk about it because people don't want to have those conversations um, and have even been asked to remove references to it in articles that I've written, which of course I have refused to do. Um, so in general, I suppose, as we continue, we're always going to be having those very uncomfortable conversations with people and really pushing for change, whether people want it or not. Um, we have also gotten various uh, statements from the young people and parents um, that we've worked with over the years, um, which made me really happy, actually. But it's lots of people just talking about how the experience had really changed them and how it was really inspiring to them um, and how it made them rethink the way that they perceived themselves in the world and what they wanted to do and the things that they cared about. Um, and I think that's extremely important. Sorry. Um, so in terms of the impact that we've had to date, um, there's been lots of it. I don't want to repeat myself too much, um, but we've there's been all sorts of things. And again, we've had amazing feedback from loads of different kids um, over the years um, in a real range of ways. So like I said before, we had lots of people like those boys who have reassessed their life goals, what they want to do in life. Um, that maybe it is worth the effort of working really hard in school, pushing to take better A levels, pushing against um, institutional and systemic racism. Um, there are lots of kids who have talked about um, just, you know, looking after their own mental health, thinking things like, you know, if they're angry or upset, they'll just go out to the local park and just sit there for 10, 20 minutes by themselves and just breathe, um, which I think is incredibly important. Um, you know, the camps are all about empowerment and that's all of the feedback that we've gotten back has suggested that that's been really effective. Um, yeah, and I suppose it's just lots of young people realising that um, just because they maybe don't have personal experience, at least up to that point with people who have managed to step up and away um, from poverty and from, you know, the difficulties of racism doesn't mean that they're not insurmountable. This meeting is being recorded. So in terms of scaling, um, Black to Nature has always had the goal of scaling up and getting bigger. And quite frankly, the only barrier has been money in the past few years. So in the very first year in 2015, we were only running one camp and we were working with 
um, less than 10 kids. Um, since then, we've worked with over 200, possibly closer to 300 kids. Um, and we are always, always ramping up the numbers, um, of, except for last year, obviously, but when we didn't have the opportunity to do camps themselves, we diversified. We ended up doing various family events where family units were able to come out of the city last August and spend some time in the outdoors. And we were able to have those conversations with them again. Um, we did several tree planting days that were really, really effective. We had probably about 200 people just come to those actually. Um, and again, it was lots of people wanting to escape the city. And we especially um, did a lot of work on those days with lots of kids that were homeschooled um, from Muslim communities and most of them had been taken out of school by them, pa their parents because they were really struggling. They maybe had things like undiagnosed ADHD or learning difficulties and were also again facing discrimination from teachers. And they said that coming on those um, tree planting days and able to just spend loads of time outdoors and with their family um, was incredibly recuperating for them. Um, so this year we have quite a few more camps, um, including a new camp just for teenage girls who aren't able to come on mixed sex camps, the normal teen camps, but more of them, camps for primary school age children, camps for families, and um, we are also for the first time able to work with kids from London rather than kids from the Southwest, which is incredibly exciting. And that one's longer, that one's five days instead of a long weekend. Um, we are doing a camp for people from Cardiff as well. And we're also doing a women's camp for about a hundred women um, who have talked about how important it would be for them to be able to escape the I suppose, traditions and expectations of quite often being a stay at home mother um, within their communities. Um, so that's sort of really exciting. But again, we're always looking to be able to do more. And one thing that we would love to be able to do is go a bit further afield. Like I said, we're mainly based in the Southwest at the moment. Um, so if we had more funding, we would be able to do more camps, work with more people, um, starting earlier in the spring and running later through into the autumn by using indoor locations with dorms um, instead of camping the whole time. We would also need more staff to run more camps, more conferences and training. Um, and that would be how we expanded and continued to scale up. But like I said, um, at this point, money probably is our only barrier. Um, so in terms of how we have adapted, um, we're constantly adapting, constantly evolving. Um, so originally our intention was only ever to work with kids age 12 through 18, not, um, but we've obviously ended up working with pretty much everyone from every age, um, including again, the primary school kids, which that was just an experiment. We decided to try one and they went amazingly well. So we've continued those. Um, and also, um, like I mentioned, we're looking into doing some adult camps with women. Um, so we've had some feedback that some Muslim girls are not allowed to come to mixed camps. And so we're going to be trying a single sex camp this year and seeing how that goes. Um, we had some mums come to one of our um, primary school camps a few years ago. And the reason that we're doing that is literally because we had mothers coming up to us who had been chaperoning their kids, saying that they would just love to come and do this for a weekend without the children. Um, so we thought, again, that would be a great thing to try. Um, we're giving an indoor site a go this year and seeing if that works better when the weather isn't so good as it so often is, um, and hopefully extending the season that we're able to work with people. Um, we're also partnering with organisations so that we can reach out further and have more impact. Um, COVID has been really difficult for everyone, including us this past year. Um, but we're still doing all of the events that we found that we uh, that I was talking about earlier, the family days, the tree planting days. Um, and we also um, were, you know, pushing those dates around to be able to do them with, you know, surprise lockdowns and things like that. Um, we've started using taxis this year, paying for taxis for people that can't afford to get out of the city rather than minibuses due to COVID safety. 
Um, and, you know, we had so many families coming out, out of the city, out of their neighborhood who hadn't escaped there for over a year. Um, and one of the things that we do, sorry, with the primary camps again, to make sure that we're getting the kids, I suppose, from more, I suppose more working class backgrounds basically, but also from various communities, is that we offer any of the camps to be free for anyone who can't afford to pay what is a relatively low price anyway. Um, but also we offer free meals. Um, so we give them free fish and chips and ice cream each to the primary kids. And for a lot of them, that's the original incentive to come out and then all of the other benefits come later. Um, so like I mentioned before, we're always looking for new ways to work with people to get people out. Um, and yeah, we're always going to be diversifying and evolving, I suppose. Um, so in terms of the project this summer, um, we're starting as soon as possible. Um, and we, if we got the money, um, we would do the following for the VME people that we're working with. So we would do seven camps for teenagers and children, um, weekend camps. We would do one camp for teenage girls, for those who aren't allowed to attend mixed camps. We'd do three family nature days. We'd do four family tree planting days. We'd do four food growing days at the community farm for community elders. Um, and we would also do four food growing days for the families. Um, so in terms of the costs, um, we would pay 26,000 for VME community expert training and consultancy um, to, uh, you know, for anti-racism diversity organizations. And then we can provide free support for the smaller organizations that we're working with. So that's about 250 pounds a day, um, uh, two days a week. Um, so in dollars, that's about, that's, I converted it, it's $36,850. Um, um, so our administrator, we pay £15 an hour, um, self-employed two days a week. So that is um, £1,200, £12,480, which in dollars is 17688 pounds 32 cents um so the cost of the camps is th about three thousand pounds per camp and we would be doing eight of them so that would be twenty four thousand pounds or roughly thirty four thousand dollars um and the one day events cost about five hundred pounds but we'd be doing 15 of them so that's seven thousand five hundred pounds or about ten thousand six hundred dollars um and to fix some of the equipment that we've already invested in so that we're able to use it again like tents um and to pay for storage that is um just under five hundred pounds or around seven hundred us dollars so the, that total is just under um a hundred thousand dollars um i'm so sorry if this has been too long i just really want to be effective um you know, I think what we do is so, so important and everyone that we've ever, like everyone that we work with agrees. Um, and this money would just completely transform Black to Nature, um, completely take us to a whole new level. We'd be able to work with so many more people, be able to do so many more different things. Um, and it would just, yeah, it would completely transform us. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um,